Thank you, Christina. Thank you for um, um, hosting me here, hosting this talk. It's a great pleasure. So I'm going to talk about, uh, provide you an overview of the research on affective technologies, particularly well-being and mental health, that I have done with my research group and network of collaborators pretty much over five, ten years now, looking back. And ethics is very relevant for this topic and it's going to be a red thread throughout my presentation. And here now I'm going to emphasize the ethical aspects of the work that we have done. So about three years ago, we completed a systematic review of HCI work on affective systems. We pretty much look back at uh, previously 10 years published papers in CKI proceedings. And we targeted systems built around three affective disorders, stress, bipolar condition and depression, because these are the most prevalent and the most with the highest societal impact. And um, findings have shown that HCI space um, here is targeting mostly data-driven systems, uh, focusing on sensing, collecting, displaying data to support self-tracking and diagnosis of these conditions. In contrast, there is less work focusing on clinical interventions, and those are targeting mostly CPT, structured interventions such as computerized cognitive behavioral therapy, biofeedback interventions and mindfulness. So there are pockets of work starting to grow. The growth in this field, I have to reassure you, is exponential. So it's going to be far more coming up as we, as we move towards future. Um, ethics, it's clearly an important topic of what I'm talking about today. So I'm going to try to tell you, it's, it's also a key part of our findings. We have a section on ethics alone. Um, Two thirds of these papers, just remember, these are papers looking at affective disorders, right? Do not mention ethics, right? And those that do, the other third, are focusing primarily on the autonomy principle. This is about respecting users' choice, ability to make choices and consent, and uh, non maleficence principle, which is about not harming. So, we look at these papers, look how they deal with different, different ethical principles and try to articulate some of the best practices that are emerging in the field. So first, diagnosis can be highly problematic, right? It perpetuates stigma, but more importantly, when provided without support for therapeutic assistance, can really backfire. You leave somebody with a diagnosis of depression could be hugely problematic for any self-help apps. Second, logging personal data can improve the accuracy of the diagnosis and also personalization of the treatment. But issues of data ownership are huge in this space. Third, involving users is key to support autonomy and a voice to ensure that their voice is being heard. But at the same time, highly vulnerable users might benefit from screening because engaging in research can be, might be detrimental to their health. To their health. So this is a very important finding. And fi <clears throat> finally, there is an abundance of data on social media, on public, public sites, but harnessing the data, secondary research data for research, could also be problematic because issues of consent can still raise. And um, I think as researchers, we should be mindful if we try to extract the data. It's very easy to de-identify participants. Right, with respect to affective health technologies, we also looked at how user acceptance and long-term use can be better supported. This is important given that digital interventions require a little bit of a longer-term use, and discontinuing the app before the end of the interventions might be actually detrimental to people. So what did we do? In order to help designers think for long-term acceptance of health technologies, we developed TAC Toolkit. It just got accepted at CHI. We are very happy it got Best Paper Award as well. Um, it's a design tool to support reflection on user acceptance and also how this acceptance evolves through user journey. And this is very interesting. A user journey can start even before we engage with the technology. Could be a pre-use stage when we explore, ask advice, contemplate, and select a specific technology. Then we have initial acceptance, usually the first week of use. This can make or break our engagement with tech. But then we also have sustained acceptance, which goes from over a month to even below, further down over a year of use. So you can see these are very important stages within user acceptance. Each of them, as I will tell you on the next slide, involves different set of factors of shaping the acceptance. So the technology acceptance toolkit consists of 16 cards, three personas, 
free temporal multi-choice scenarios, a virtual think space, and a website from where the cards can be freely downloaded. To design the TAC cards, we critically reviewed there is a rich space of uh, literature on user acceptance. And we selected and operationalized some of the valid models for user acceptance. We also included our own uh, technology acceptance uh, life, ci life cycle that we published in a Jeremiah paper a bit earlier, where again we tried to bring forward this temporal dimension of user acceptance and provide it a more consistent terminology because the terms are used so interchangeably, the same term with different meanings, that the space is quite conceptually quite messy. So we try to bring a little bit of conceptual clarity here. So from these models, uh, we extracted 16 key factors impacting acceptance and designed one card for each of these. We also organized them in three color-coded categories, health for, uh, in red, individuality and social, so social aspects in or orange, and technology in blue. And we evaluated the toolkit with uh, 21 digital health designers through workshops. And findings show that acceptance, which is rather an abstract concept, we know that from all the work we've done with literature review, um, it became far more accessible to the designers through the use of the cards, concrete and accessible. Expanding their awareness of the different factors that might be relevant. Um, also, prompt them to think about future acceptance, future future use of the tech and we really this is where they really challenge we think about how this tech will be used six months from now a year from now and i think we can really benefit from additional designs methods or tools to support that future thinking and of course you can borrow from the existing pockets of work speculative design and future thinking design but something of that could be really is really needed for this long-term acceptance designing for long-term acceptance so Emphasizing again, it is this macro temporal perspective which I think makes this paper quite unique and really needed because often we design for a situated interaction but don't have this unfolding temporality in, in our mind. So now I will illustrate uh, some of our work we've done on emotional awareness technologies uh, through three, we call them design exemplars. They are really three points within the broader design space. I chose them so I hope they can inspire you and provoke your thinking. And I will start with an um, affective health system. This involves a galvanic skin response, which measures skin conductance or perspiration, and a wealth of research has shown that it's associated with increase of physiological arousal. And therefore, we can say with also our in more intense emotions, be them positive or negative. Um, as a T study is published in 2019, but we did it quite a few years earlier. We're in many wearable devices at the time. We use a Philips uh, wristband, which has uh, GSR sensors within. And this has been connected to a mobile app where we had some very beautiful visualizations of physiological arousal shown in real time. Also historically, you can look and browse back. And um, there is a spiral shape, which, which has a chronology on it. And we have colors of red mapped to high arousal and something in the green uh, side of the color spectrum which mapped low arousal. People can make annotations and so forth. And we evaluated the system with 23 participants who use it for a month. And um, as they were learning to make sense of their GSR data. Now, GSR sensors is a new technology for uh, comparing, for instance, with heart rate monitors that most people are more familiar with. So it took time for them to try to understand what the system is showing them. And we call this a proto practice, a newly emergent practice. And these ambiguous representations that have been shown to them, we found that people interpreted them in different ways subject to what matters in their lives. So some of them did it for stress management. Others did it for performance. Some of them were athletes, um, performance monitoring. And others did it just for pure life logging. So our conclusion here is that if we are designing and involving, we don't involve a well-established practice, but it's a proto-practice, like making sense of GSR data, a more open, ambiguous design is useful, allowing people to project the meanings that are relevant to them. It's likely that when a more specific meaning is identified, then I think we have to play with the ambiguity a little bit more carefully, right, as a design principle. But at this stage, it felt, uh, it felt right. Moving away from traditional screen interfaces, we did quite a bit of work with smart materials. 
now, I don't know, maybe many of you have heard they are growing, the interest in smart materials is growing in, in HCI uh, community. We borrow a lot from material sciences. I think they are very interesting materials. They bring forward a different range of constraints and affordances. And as designers, make us think deeply about our assumptions because you operate with something that it's not, you don't find it in screen based interfaces. So similar to affective health systems, we system, we also uh, use GSR sensors here. Um, and, but we focus explicitly on the exploration of a broader range of actuators. We want, of course, it's not just visual, um, but we also work with haptics. And I'm going to show you our exemplars. So, um, first of all, I'm starting with some visual smart material interfaces. This involves thermochromic paints. So these are materials which become actuated by heat. There is a heating layer under them. Then you have an insulation layer and you can have it on your skin. Um, they can be flexible in different sizes. You can put them on your wrist, you can put them on your body, on your clothes, you can put them on your shoes. People, our participants did all kinds of crazy stuff with them. And the two prototypes I'm showing here uh, provide again some abstract, some ambiguous representations of changes of arousal. The first one, I'm not sure if my video, my, if it's working. Ah, it's working. So you can see how it actuates. Now I'm going to start the bottom one. So the first one is showing increases in arousal reflected in colors changing from blue and green to red. And the second one is changing from uh, purple to pink. The heating layer beneath is shaped in different ways as a spiral on the top and as a heart on the bottom. So therefore, the visualization resembles those shapes. Um, and you can see they are slow, right? Now, this slowness, it's a very important design quality, which we don't, wouldn't have thought about if we, did, if we work with, with screen-based interfaces, which are very responsive, right? And it's a quality that we bear in mind in the future designs. And we evaluated this with six participants in the lab. They were just low-level prototypes. But people liked, people like the ambiguity, and they also like this slow change of colors which unfolds in front of their eyes. They really liked it very much. Someone has very aesthetic qualities, almost like a performance. They were captivated. But they would also have liked to have control over the colors. We choose these thermochromic paints very carefully to map red with intense arousal and green blue with low arousal. But in practice, actually they would have liked to take the prototypes and use them, but they said, I would like to use them conspicuously in public. I don't want people to understand that I'm stressed if the device becomes red, so they wouldn't like to work with socially loaded color meanings. And um, this is something, again, we remember later. Then we continue developing additional pro prototypes, six more, involving both visual, the first three, and haptic actuators. Um, I'm not going to insist much on the visual, but just the, the second one, it's quite interesting. Here we played with three colors rather than just two and showed map red to high arousal, yellow to middle arousal. So we came with a middle level of arousal, which actually proved to be quite useful, and uh, blue to low arousal. And then the last three are haptic. They are really wristbands. Um, one consists of mini vibration motors, which vibrate when the arousal is high. One is a shape memory alloy, which gently squeezes a hand uh, when the arousal is high. And the other one is a flexible conductive fiber which generate worms, again, when the arousal is high. So they are all designed in order to prompt emotional awareness. So we evaluated them with 12 participants using them for a couple of days. And again, this was outside of the lab. And follow up with interviews. And our findings show that um, their value in supporting people understand their emotional responses and also developing awareness for affective chronometry. This is a concept from psychology and is really understanding how emotions unfold in time. The physiological arousal raises and decays. And each emotional experience we have has a, sig has a signature of some sort. Sometimes can be a speak, sometimes, sometimes can increase lower, at a slower pace, but we have this. And we haven't built these slow visual visualizations using thermochromic paints, particularly, this affective chronometry um, awareness would not have been, would not be able to capture. So an important finding is a display made people pay attention in the moment of how they felt. It's very hard to ignore them, uh, particularly the, particularly the uh, haptic ones, because you don't necessarily have to look at them, right? But they look at visual ones as well. Um, 
and they also supported the interpretation of arousal. At the beginning, people associated discrete emotions with these displays, uh, which of course this is not what they represented, they represented arousal. But towards the third day, most of them managed to decouple the arousal from the violence, right? So an intense, an actuation means high arousal. This is a very important because it really challenged our full psychology of our models. We don't think about emotions in terms of circumplex model, the two, two dimensions, arousal and violence, but we talk about in terms of discrete emotions. But this use of the prototypes really allow them to understand this distinction very viscerally. Um, and the color display involving three colors was very helpful to help them develop this clarity, this disambiguation from discrete into the space of arousal alone. <coughs> in contrast to visual displays, the haptic ones were perceived as more embodied. They were really touching the skin in a way that affected the visual one didn't. And the gradual increase in temperature was very expressive and quite hedonic quality. So again, it's something we bear in mind in future work. So we took home from here four design implications emotional skill for our well-being. This is when you try to realize something you don't know life and are trying to do something to, to better regulate our emotions. And uh, this slow changes that have become friends support users to hold their attention on their displays. Um, also, the slowness in countries reflection and again, the temporal ambiguity that this place shown motivates people to pause and, and, and be more aware of their affecting knowledge. And finally, we argue for the value of expressivity. Uh, represented emotional states, and again, using three colors and then two to show high, maybe a medium or low level arousal is particularly useful. So, after we build these smart prototypes, we deconstructed them and put together a toolkit. Uh, this was intended to support novice users to build their own personalized affective displays. And addresses the need for personalization that we've seen all in our findings. Of course, we also try to borrow a little bit from the growing work in HCI on DIY and maker movement and democratization of technology making, and we aim to do all of those things as well. So, um, also, most of the affected displays will have outlet boxes. So, opening them up and allowing people to work with them could be quite useful to understand the mental models behind the stack. And, uh, support, as I said, personalization, but also agency, adoption, and also attachment to this display, as we also found in our findings. It's the IKEA effect, right? Mm -hmm. So we created this toolkit consisting of digital and traditional materials and allow people to do this hype project and build their own affected displays. So the thermal pixel kit included thermochromic paint on the top, uh, top left. Heating materials on the top right, GSR sensors and their connectors on the bottom left, insulation material in the bottom middle, and supporting tools like paint brushes, paint spreader for applying the paint, syringes, and so forth on the bottom right. And we explore the toolkit with, again, through co design workshops with 20 participants, 11 were males, 9 females with no expertise in biosensors or thermocontrols. And each workshop consisted, consisted of three sessions. First, we asked them to sketch representation of emotional arousal using paper and pencils, colors. Then we introduced them to the kit, and, uh, and they explored the kit just to understand how the materials work. And then we asked them to build the prototypes based on the sketches they done in the first session. In this part, we also gave them, um, uh, exposed them to a set of images to elicit arousal, so they actually see how the prototypes will be activated in real time. And then we conducted interviews to see how they perceive the experience of working with the kit and uh, the design of, the, of their designs and the use of the prototypes. So, a very important finding is that despite their limited expertise, all participants were able to design and successfully build their devices. Um, it allowed people also to use the body in the design. Body was actively used. We elicited arousal using the pictures, but they also tried to try to get themselves excited or to cool down, start to move around, to activate the prototypes through their body. So body as an element, active element in the design came forward with these findings. Um, and of course, personalization was shining for our findings. They were very delighted to do that. And for the creative expression that they, you know, the making of the prototypes allowed. 
um, this is an important outcome because most of the toolkits in the DIY literature talks about people assembling stuff, but here was not just assembling, they had this creative expression that came through as well. Um, a key finding is that there are two distinct motivations for designing such interfaces. Some participants did it for awareness of emotions, so for example, they used predominantly red colors, angular shape, um, because it was increased over hours of life. And the other, other set of participants did it for emotional regulation. They used more soft colors, soft patterns, blue or green colors, and more round shapes. And I'm also going to say, these two motivations were very gendered. Um, and the toolkit was used to design affective interfaces for these two different purposes, emotional awareness and emotional regulation. But you could also build them for both. You can have two displays, build the same materials, supporting both, uh, both these two functions. Both are key for emotional well-being. But very little work is about how both awareness and regulation can be supported through, through the same kind of uh, technology. Um, and this is this is a key outcome of our file. Another implication is that um, by exper experimenting with the toolkit, participants developed a uh, rich visual understanding of their arousal and decoupling from the violence. I mentioned the earlier as well, it came to this pretty sport as well. Um, okay, and also participants became attached to the part they can build. They would have liked to take these prototypes and use really like. So people develop attachment to these uh, prototypes, which um, and would have liked to take them to use them in daily life, which was a very nice outcome. Right, so um, I talked about emotional awareness, a couple of prototypes we built, and now I'm going to move forward towards a more exciting space, emotional regulation. This is a little bit more challenging. And although affective interfaces supporting emotional awareness also allow people to self-regulate, like the, the one that I've shown, they kind of realize, oh, this is high arousal. I came and I came from a, from a, from a meeting with my supervisor. Maybe I can try to do something to lower my arousal and see what's happening. Let me be brief. They did a bit of that, but the device wasn't purposefully tailored to support self-regulation of affect. And this is something we try to do through this body of work. And here we use a range of technologies. We use, again, wearables. We use 3D printed food, very interestingly. We look at mobile apps of different sizes, and we also looked at wall-sized displays. So I will start with thermochromic and vibro uh, thermal and vibrotactile interfaces. Um, so building on users' strong preference for personalization of affected interfaces, we started this, this work by looking at uh, how we can co-design affect regulation technologies uh, that are personalized by people, right? And um, in terms of the modality, we choose to go with haptic. Uh, haptic patterns, which we have seen that are more embodied and also do not demand visual attention, which is key in everyday life, right? Um, and therefore, we thought it would be a good starting point. And for this, we, we, we conducted a study which consisted of two parts. In the first part, we gave to our haptic group two commercial devices. Uh, they are wrist-worn devices, one that provides precise uh, localized thermal sensations, the top image, and another one which provides uh, vibrations, the bottom image. And each haptic actuator uh, was connected to a mobile interface uh, application, and participants could explore it and also change the actuator's parameters. It wasn't a vast design, design space. They, they have one or two choices, but definitely was a sense of personalization that came forward. So people could vary temperature from minus 11 to plus 16 degrees Celsius from their body temperature. And they can also vary vibration frequency from 30 to 185 bits per minute and vibration intensity from 5% to 100% more. In the second part of the study, the haptic group received the personalized patterns that they have created for each for themselves. Um, during a stressor task, we give them a, 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 a very well-defined stressor task from the literature. And the control group, which did not design, not receive any haptic patterns, were still exposed to the same stressor task. And we collected self-measurements of 
anxiety using an event, uh, stay questionnaire, state trait anxiety inventory, and we also capture HRV data and a range of metrics around that to, to identify the level of stress. And then we continue with interviews with the haptic group to see how they design the patterns and how they perceive the value of the patterns during the stressor task. Now, overall, the findings show that the haptic patterns, be them vibrotactile or thermal, uh, significantly lower the, the stress level um, through both objective and subjective measure of stress for the haptic group compared to the, to the control group. So, um, for vibrotactile patterns, most participants created low frequency vibrations of 30 bits per minute rather than high frequency one. You know, we have two, but they, I think they are a bit more of an exception. And also associated them with a heartbeat. We didn't tell them they resonate with a heartbeat, but they are with lower heart rate. And they also thought that this low frequency vibration would represent a slow target heart rate when they need to calm down, as shown in this illustrative quote. I went for the lowest 30 bit per minute. Actually, they would have gone even lower if the system would have allowed them. I could get. The reason is that I felt slower. It was nicer to come down at a slow rate rather than when it's really high. That is like more panicky. Only two participants did not associate the vibration with heart rate, but they still appreciate the slow rhythm. For the thermal patterns, things were a bit more, more diverse. Half of participants designed to increase the temperature between 2 to 10 degrees more than their body temperature. And they referred to this pattern as warm. They didn't want it too hot, but warm was good. Warm was quite hedonic, um, comforting, resembling the human touch, as we've seen in the first quote. It feels like someone is holding your hand. We had this expectation as, as a design stage. It's nice to see that it came through the findings. Other half of participants designed their patterns by decreasing the temperature from minus 8 to minus 11 degrees. Now, this was very interesting. They leverage very common metaphors of cooling yourself down. Again, they didn't like heat. And they also thought that coolness is a bit more standing out, noticeable, and because it's lacking familiarity. We don't really have, we have worms, but we don't have cool so often on, on our wrist. Um, and I will just conclude with a couple of implications that came from this study. So first, we highlight the value of supporting implicit affect regulation. This is involving unconscious cognition and no specific action. Through the entrainment, this is the entrainment of slow bodily rhythms, such as those of heartbeat, entrained by the vibration that they felt on their wrist. Such bodily slow rhythms can be super, support, supported by actuation patterns, like we've seen through the vibration. But we can also work with entrainment from other modalities. You can think of visual or sound that is pulsating in a specific rhythm, right? So we can do entrainment in different modalities. Um, and even through other haptic submodalities, like thermal. And this is very interesting, because thermal didn't lead to entrainment. It wasn't the rhythm there, but it was hedonic and embodied. And therefore, we can think now, why not, in a way, integrate them and add the, the, to the, to the warmth or coolness, let them move in a, some rhythmic 30 bits per minute, and in a way, add entrainment quality to already hedonic embodied quality of the haptics. And I think that would be a very fascinating future research direction to marry the benefits of two modalities that we just discussed, two haptic modalities. Um, and also, participants um, would have liked to have more dynamic patterns to respond to their different stress level during the stressor task. It was just a pattern they designed, and we used it throughout, throughout the entire uh, stressor task. I think it took about 10 minutes for them. And they said, oh, no, we'd have liked this to change if you are low level or increasing level, high level. So that was interesting, that people would like that to be personalized and adaptive as well. 3D printed flavors. Now, we looked at food as a resource for design. Many reasons why food. Well, first of all, it's very emotional. It's very sensorial. Uh, body is really shining in most of my work, so we could not look at food. And also, it's been historically used tremendously for emotional regulation. So um, this is part of a larger project where we look at exploring eating experiences. And we, actually, we, com we just completed a systematic review of over 100 papers in human-food interaction from the lens of eating experiences. And here I can tell you that there is an emerging trend uh, move from, uh, moving from taste stimulation towards 
multisensory flavor stimulation, right? So we want far more modalities engaged in this, in this, in this, see more modalities being engaged in this body of work. And it's not just for stimulation, but also for sensory deprivation. So we try to see how you can switch off and on some of the senses. Um, so this is what this body, uh, and, and one more thing, this body of work also starts to show an increasing interest of, in two novel sites for interaction that I think as a community are very exciting to explore, is a mouth and the viscera, the gut as new sites of interaction. And with the advent of ingestible sensors, I think this is going to be very, very promising in the near future. So, in order to explore this, I'm just going to throw in one another, I think it's a, it's a neat research tool that we develop, we call it sensory food probes, um, to support people become more aware of the eating experiences. And we use this in a diary study with five romantic couples. And it consists of a set of objects on the right-hand side for sensory augmentation and deprivation, blindfolding and gloves and nose clip, uh, but also a board game where we have evocative pictures. It's, it's a board game that the two, the people in a couple can work with each other, can play. They associate food with different elements on the board and they have, uh, they were designed in a way they are provoking, resonate with some aspects of flavor experience and so forth. So, I'm not going to insist on this, I just show you that this is what we did with these five couples for about two weeks with a diary study. And after they've been sensitized to these experiences, we engage with them in a co-design of flavors. And we want them to design five flavors. Three of them to express emotions like uh, happiness, sadness, and an emotionally neutral one, such as expressions such as say hi. And we also wanted from the, them to design two flavors for co-regulation of affect to calm down their partner and to cheer them up. And once they designed this with us, uh, then the first author uh, prepared the, the samples, uh, the flavors, and iterated with them with each participant individually so they are, they are as they should be. And then in the third stage of the study, we deploy these flavors together with a, a small 3D food printer in participants' home and let them use them as they would like for a couple of days. And then we follow up with interviews. So the 3D printed flavors supported expressivity, physicality, playfulness, joint action and gift giving. These are all strategies for connect connectedness, right? Um, in terms of the regulation, cheering up was mostly mostly used and predominantly through chocolate-based uh, <laughs> flavors. I mean, not surprisingly, uh, we have strong chocolate for strong preference for chocolate as a comfort food and uh, inducing pleasure. Calming down was supported far more through more diverse flavors, predominantly juices and teas. So what finding altogether showed the value of these 3D printed flavors for two important intimacy rituals, end of day and the evening meal. And in the paper, we discussed the lengths, uh, how our findings support um, people to really reflect, not only on remember, but also imagine flavored, positive flavors. They didn't try to create flavor for negative experiences and how such flavors can be integrated in these focal intimacy practices to support emotional co-regulation. We also looked at digital well-being uh, and how behavior regulation of limiting phone overuse can be better designed for. Now, as you are probably fully aware, there is a massively growing space of digital com commercial digital well-being apps um, but they have been limitedly explored academically. Uh, so we completed a recent functionality review of 39 most popular digital well-being apps from Google Play, but we also reviewed with the same coding scheme 17 apps developed in, uh, and described in academic work. So I think this work is quite, quite uh, extended. Um, and findings show that apps focus mostly, these apps, digital well-being apps, focus mostly on limiting screen time. And these apps are doing this through four interventions. Creating obstacles to limit use, very common, just block your phone uh, or app. Supporting awareness of reaching the set limits. This is usually done through notifications. Supporting motivation to keep within set limits. This is done often through gamification principles. And supporting focused attention away from the phone through some interventions, but they are not really super exciting, pretty much, for example, white noise, right? So just focus on something else. And not many of them are doing that. 
So, this work led to several design implications that are unpacked in the paper quite extensively. But here I'm just gonna mention one key, key one. So, for us, the most important is that the current problematic emphasis on these apps on limiting use, limiting smartphone use. We think that this, reflect, this, this does not reflect the rich body of HDI work coming on um, supporting more mindful use of technologies. And this can, I think this should mark a shift from addressing a problematic behavior by explicitly limiting it, but rather by supporting more meaningful use of smartphones. So moving from avoidance to approach motivation is surely a better way to deal with this challenge. And of course, there is a, a massively growing body of work in HCI on mindfulness technologies. I, I work on that space as well. It's not part of this talk. Actually, it was a bit touch on yesterday's talk, two days ago talk. Um, and I think that there's really ripe to be, to be leveraged for something like that to support better interaction with smartphones. And more meaningful pursuits, why not? Um, right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about commercial depression apps. So depression was really a, the, a key aspect of, uh, of, of some of my work. So we look at that from the perspective of commercial apps. And I'm gonna give you a couple of studies we analyze depression apps. This is one study we completed, content analysis of depression app descriptions on marketplaces, over 300 such apps. And the findings show that the most of these apps focus on multiple di disorders. Depression is something of, as often anxiety. And therefore, they focus on transdiagnostic interventions and also focus on multiple theories. So it's quite a high aim, right? More importantly, while many interventions appear to be evidence informed, they were, they were issued with research evidence and fit with clinical guidelines. Rather concerning, we did not find any app to fully align with treatments, their treatments with clinical guidelines. That is really, really concerning. Um, so we suggested developers uh, a set of, uh, we provided a set of reflective questions to suggest developers how we can approach this, this design a little bit better, looking at multidisciplinary collaborations to produce clinically valid, effective and safe treatments for their patients. Um, we, we asked them to, to reflect on the skills and expertise around the table that they are working with, to provide design rationale for, the, for their interventions, and of course be more sensitive towards the issues of safety and duty of care for the users, towards users. We also looked beyond app descriptions, analyzed users' reviews of apps for depression. So this paper just got accepted at CHI. Uh, and we did a thematic analysis, conducted a thematic analysis of over 2,000 user reviews, sampled from 40 depression apps from both Google Play and Apple Store. And users reported both positive and negative experiences, and some of them with strong ethical implications. I'm gonna highlight here some of the key risks that we identify was potential for misdiagnosis, and harmful advice that people receive, especially through peer support. These findings were really, really concerning, and they were very strong. Um, also concerning was the vast amount of data about usability of the apps. We are in a space, space where we're designing for experience, but the apps developed for people with mental health conditions, such as depression, still have, many of them, serious usability issues, all kind of issues. This was really, really, in a way, unexpected. I know there is a lot of pressure to put updates of the apps earlier, maybe before they are robust, but um, it could be very problematic for vulnerable people like those with depression because they cannot continue treatment, for example. Um, concerns about app validity, safety, and accuracy also raised um, with respect to the design of the intervention and design of the app in itself, the interface design as well. So we organize these elements Within, the frame, within a framework integrating biomedical and virtue ethics. So with respect to autonomy, an important design implication was that it's important to support users to choose their apps, treatment options, in-app options, and to be able to customize. Uh, and more boldly, for the developers to listen to their voice. Some of them did. These user reviews reached developers and they did changes based on those, but not all the time. With respect to access, we need to better leverage users' preference for such apps over world, real world care. This was an, another important finding. In terms of the commerce, we refer here to apps cost, business models, and consumer rights. This was one of the most passionately discussed theme 
uh, in, in user reviews. Um, they express very strong views about how these apps, many of them should be free. Uh, and very interestingly, <laughs> um, we didn't see many concerns with respect to privacy and respect for diversity. So there is very limited aware that even free apps, that in fact, are not free. They don't really realize that. Um, and then issues of trust, transparency were raised by about a quarter of the reviews, mostly about insufficient, going back to the commerce model, apps cost, treatments processes. You, you get to use an app and then additional costs are used for, hidden, for functions which were not revealed at the beginning, which, part, which users need. And that was really, really upsetting when they, after they already start using the app for a while. Um, so, so what is really needed here is more honest, transparent description of apps cost, financially or otherwise, even if in terms of personal data. And also reviewers like the, the fact that uh, there is a social impact of these apps for reducing stigma and normalizing mental health care. They appreciated that. And uh, finally, with respect to depression apps, we um, explored 29 top apps for depression through a review of their key functionalities, tracking, screening, provision of interventions. And here we found that most apps frame depression as lack of well-being, so not really a very robust way to frame depression. And uh, diagnostic was again very problematic uh, because many of these apps use non-validated screening tools. And there is again limited evidence to do that. Uh, and also most of these apps are rated as suitable for children, but where really they, uh, they did not provide any policy consistent with the rating of being, used, being, being adequate for children. Other ethical concerns include, for example, the, the sharing of suicidal thoughts, uh, like high, highly negative content, and limited support for suicidal risks. Again, especially for those apps which allow this sharing. And as design implication, we argue for the importance of safeguarding users while accessing and consuming negative content. And again, sell, select age-appropriate apps. Support is needed for that. And also, most apps capture mood or thoughts, but not necessarily together. I think integrating these two things are very important. And also, we suggest integrating this track content with the progress made through the intervention, so that people can see how the mood they track is is is, is reflected. Uh, it's 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 mapping their engagement in the intervention and motivate them to continue with the intervention. And the very last part, we explore a bit of work in the space of dementia. This is part of a larger project where we investigated how people living with dementia can be supported through increased stimulation. And again, we start to look beyond screens, beyond particularly small screens that have been often used in dementia care, and look for something novel. And this is how you build dementia wall. This is a prototype consisting of nine high-quality displays arranged in an L-shaped grid, which we deploy for over a year in a residential care home. We found significant engagement and adoption of the, of the prototype, which was extensively used. I'm not sure how many of you work in pervasive system area as well. Well, I can tell you that public displays are, uh, are really challenging in terms of long-term engagement. Uh, and the way that this, this study showed that was particularly relevant and useful was really, really a, a little bit different than, than the body of work we already seen. And this is because we employ a very co-participatory research method, the staff, staff care uh, in the house, took ownership of these displays and really used them the way they see it fit for their residents. And they actually generated four new psychosocial interventions inspired by the dementia wall, supporting sensory, emotional, cognitive, and social stimulation for the elderly. This stimulation is very important. So one such example, for, exa for instance, is bringing the life no longer accessible to these residents, some of them, most of them advanced dementia, uh, allowing them to re-experience these things very dear to them, like, for example, a, a, a mass in a church. Um, another important one I'm just going to highlight now is intervention for mood and behavior regulation using nature-inspired media. This is this content, you know, seascapes and uh, forest landscapes were sourced online by the care staff and who took very active role to select the content curated for the specific needs in the moment of their residents. Um, Video of sunny beaches and uh, waves breaking gently were particularly useful. Supporting people to handle their agitation, which was very high, especially at night. So we have this very powerful quote, with severe dementia, there is a lot of walking. So that one resident, for example, almost exhausts herself, but with the right image, she would relax almost instantaneously. Shoulder would drop and she would sit and look at the screen. 
The display was so used that even after a year we decided we have to leave it in, it was quite expensive, but became part of the, the home care fabric of life, would have been unethical to remove, and I, it's still being used now several years later. So this is what I have to say. I just want to thank, thank my fantastic PhD students. Uh, the first three of them on the top line have graduated in the last year. Camille has survived up pending and Dion is writing up. And some of my amazing academics that I've been working with over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Well, I'd like to um, ask something. Earlier you said uh, that it was highly gendered. Um, could you return back to that piece? Because that was sort of like a little dangling tease. Yeah, it was a tease, indeed. Yes, um, all female participants went for straight affect regulation. All male participants went for affect awareness. Very interesting. That is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a quick question about like the earlier part of your presentation where you talked about um, you know using GSR sensors and giving sort of uh, feedback about the state of arousal. Um, I was wondering how accurate these sensors were, and in cases when if they were not accurate, and you know, like my device told me that I was aroused and I was not, how would I react to that? What was do you do any do you have any findings on that? Yeah, it's a good good, good question. Of course, they are not. They are wearable sensors, they are not lab sensors. And we also have a little bit of delay, we take about five seconds with time window to get the response. So they are in a moment, but, and some emotions are very, very fleeting. So that's a very good question. But you know, people experimented with them a lot. They try to understand the meaning. They put them on the windshield, they start to run with them. I don't know if some of them showered with them. They did all kind of moving hands. Mm -hmm. They try to make the sense. And sometimes meaning could have been portrayed when the data was inaccurate. Um, but what was important is that towards the end of the study, which was just a couple of days, they did decouple. So I think the, we don't really, we work a lot with biomedical engineers and signal processing people in, in, in our project. I didn't put here acknowledgement, yeah, anyway. But this was part of a big European funded project. Um, and they are very going for the whole grain. I think in HCI we have to be more tolerant about the, the, the robust, not robust, the, the, the pure accuracy of our data. Yeah. It, it was enough to provoke. And if they couldn't make sense, actually some of them trusted the display, others started to trust their feelings a little bit more, which is also another positive thing. So I think it's an interesting issue about locus of control there. Uh, we have a question on Zoom. Sure. I study wearables and lead an initiative at Stanford around wearables. So thank you so much, Professor Sass, for your very engaging talk. And uh, I. I I wonder if you could please share your thoughts about using VR, virtual reality, for affect control. Thank you. I think that's a very good question, very, very timely and topical question. Um, I have to say I did engage with VR. Uh, feels like another time during my PhD. I moved away from VR for different reasons, but it's coming very, very strongly. For that, I think we just put another European beat using VR for, for, for emotion regulation. I think. There is a lot of potential. Um, I mean, of course, you can leverage lots of aspects of VR, sense of presence, immersion. Um, and particularly, I think it would be nice to see how it can be used for materializing emotional states mm -hmm. in a physical form that we can play with them tangibly. I really, really, this is my, I, I really like to leverage VI not because of its inherent qualities that you can do anything. You can do coaching or, but what can be very good for emotional regulation? I think this is a really interesting space. Otherwise, it provides a functionality that might not be better than what Zoom provides. That's what I'm always thinking. What, how, how clever design has to be done to address a problem in a very novel way. And I think this materialization of emotional states that we can, we process and change by interacting with them, I don't know, as avatars or whatever, I think would be quite powerful. Does it answer your question? Oh, yes, thank you so much. Yeah, I can I can uh, get several ideas from your answer about maybe different avatars of animals or people or just creative settings that might help people. What do you want Thank you. Well, I'd like to know a little bit um, your comment about uh, apps for depression. It's 
uh, a little obvious if you think about it, but then the consequences are utterly terrifying. Do you have thoughts about a better way to approach the situation? I think there are lots of pools uh, outside of academic realm. I think we might try to engage as policymakers. This is happening a little bit in the UK. Actually, Dion is working for NICE, which is uh, setting standards for... And she, she was a student, actually, who's working on ethics and most of the work on digital... Uh, on, on apps for depression, their ethics. I think uh, regulating to some sense. I, I know there are no medical devices, but there is a sense of some additional regulation should come in. We don't want to distract self-help, but not necessarily for people who are already highly vulnerable, like people with the depression diagnosis. Now, of course, some people can have depression diagnosis without being actually diagnosed and na navigate towards these apps. But I think cl clear, clear clarity for what kind of users they, these apps are suitable for, what kind of users are not suitable. This is not currently being... Uh, explain on the marketplace. I think the marketplace should have clear, I think we provide this in a paper, clear structure of how these apps are, are the information is provided, so they have comparison across. Um, so yeah, I think I, I, there is no clear solution. We really have to engage with policymakers, I think, if we work in this space. And I apologize, I would ask a follow-up because uh, you speak a little fast. I missed, as do I, I have missed a uh, your explanation about why setting the defense was problematic? Well, peer, peer support. Peer support. Peer support is often, um, it could come from a good place, but doesn't have the necessary skill to communicate what needed communicating. So it could be judgmental. It happened. Yeah. People might even feel harassed, bullied. So the, some of the quotes were really, really scary. This was a very, very sad, unsurprising finding that we find, and I really have to highlight it here. Mm. So the paper is not presented yet, but um, yeah, we'll be <laughs> we'll highlight that at Kai. I did have one more question. I'm trying not to talk you. <laughs> so um, you said, of course, we need more policy changes with the apps in the marketplace. But uh, as academics, uh, we teach students. Uh, when we teach behavior change, when we teach these things, how should we uh, actually, what what rules should we make for ourselves to make sure that students are, because you, you talked about design thinking, design thinking moves very quickly. How should we be teaching uh, students how to approach these sorts of problems? Mm. Well, I think probably for, for example, stepping into the space of mental, mental health support, which is the bar is much higher. It's very hard to work with those users, to, to recruit them. And I think you shouldn't do it without working with some medical medical staff as well. So I do work very interdisciplinary. Maybe work with, with on the other end, people who do have concerns, but they are not at the level of clinical significance. And I think that's a far more safer space. And at this time, I start working with my PhD student earlier on. We don't go into the space of depression straight away, I try to go with people who have who have mental well-being concerns. And you can have, I mean, it's not a black and white. We are on a continuum, all of us, and fluctuate. Um, and I, I, would, I would keep in this space. I think it's safer for them, for us. As researchers, they are also exposed to a range of challenges. I think we have to be mindful of how we mitigate those. Uh, our students have access to coaching, mentoring, had access to uh, potential uh, counseling sessions if the content they unpacked in the studies were, was, was uh, distressing them. So I think yeah, the researchers' well-being is very important and had, had to be very carefully nurtured. I have a question about, Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, question about the human-food interaction uh, study, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, I was curious why you chose uh, to evaluate it with romantic partners. Yeah. Um, instead of like just other user groups, what, what the motivation behind that was? I think we wanted to move in from self-regulation to the space of co-regulation. And there, there is a sense of some kind of knowing each other. And I actually, I worked with romantic couples before. I think it's an interesting space. It brings up lots of things about emotion. It, it, it allows you to dig deeper into the emotional space that you wouldn't otherwise. So it wasn't just the food. We're also interested in the emotional aspect quite, quite, quite a lot. That's why we chose them to design these five flavors. And for home deployment, we wanted some interaction around them, not just one person. 
So that allows us to see the collaborative practices, uh, the household rituals, and uh, I think it unpacked a little bit more, added this social dimension a little bit more. Coming up on uh, the hour, so perhaps we can uh, have one more thank you.